Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Jim. Um, thanks for the quick lesson in British history. If, um, if my marketing police at CMU were in the room, they would be terribly upset that I used a, a homemade title slide. They would much rather that I used one of their corporate slide decks to reinforce the notion that Carnegie Mellon University was founded by a Scot, and the university is very proud of its Scottish heritage. And whenever anybody is appointed to the faculty, they are sent to a, an accent finishing school to develop a Scottish <laughs> accent. And after two years, I've just about got there. What they would also want me to do is to use some of their standard slides on things like university reputation and rankings. And broadly, what they do is they take any um, discipline or field in which we are better than Stanford. That was about 30 seconds, wasn't it, guys? Um, <clears throat> and they turn that into a, a presentational thing. And they will use all sorts of imagery to show how many Nobel Prizes and Oscars and Emmys and so on our faculty and our alumni have won. This is an interesting slide, and I, it was the only one where I could make the point that when we think about reputation, rankings, and so on, we often are fixated on citation counts and the impact of science and so on. But when I think about CMU and its role as a top-notch STEM university with a top-notch fine arts program and conservatory program, it does reinforce in my mind that we have never really debated or solved how we manage reputation and rankings for the arts and to an extent the humanities in our universities. And I'm afraid that's the only point at which I can make that um, mention in this presentation. So as Jim said, I've led libraries in a number of countries around the world. And particularly in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, I was part of or subject to government-imposed research assessment type regimes. Thankfully, in many ways, I'm too far removed from the detail of what's happening in those countries to offer you know, a, a very intense perspective on current trends there, and other speakers will be able to do that. But yesterday, you know, some of us were here for the Evolving Scholarly Record workshop, and Jim mentioned Ronald Cosey, the great British market economist. And anyone who studied market economics will know about the business cycles. And when I think about business cycles in the context of the theme for today and tomorrow, I'm conscious that different countries represented at this event have gone through a very different timeline. I'm not saying that the Brits were first, but certainly in my experience, 1986 was the first research assessment exercise in the UK, and that flowed along through the 90s. Then we saw in New Zealand the emergence of the performance-based research framework in about 2003. We also saw the emergence of global re research rankings. You know, Jiao Tong came out in 2003, the Times World rankings in 2004, the Leiden rankings in 2007. And that trend has continued in recent years through to the emergence of the Excellence in Research for Australia program um, in 2010, the QS World Rankings, and so on. And the point behind all of that is that different countries are operating at different paces here, and therefore different universities are operating at a different pace, and the libraries and the research administration infrastructure also are operating on a different business cycle in different countries. I think there were a couple of Scots in the room yesterday, and we were talking about some of the, the motivations behind this, and you know, one of the, the concerns about the library being seen as an agent of the state. We're out there with the big stick, trying to force our researchers into compliance with a regime that, frankly, nobody wants to be part of. And that is something we very much need to be alert to. We don't want to be seen as the police turning up to knock faculty into shape. But I do believe that there is much to be gained in this space by thinking about the carrot approach, that our universities can learn much more about their research performance, their standing in the world, and I do think that we have much to contribute as information scientists and librarians in that space. So my overriding theme in these opening remarks is that our skills and competencies as information specialists really do position us at the heart of the reputation ranking movement 
in our institutions, in our countries, and indeed in the landscape of international research. So in framing how I want to address this, I've pulled together a few slides. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, what I want to talk about firstly is the, the research assessment and impact agenda and the various stakeholders, the governments, the research funders, the research institutions, and indeed individual researchers, say a bit about resource discovery in the context of how our institutions secure research funding, attract the best researchers, find the best collaborators, say a few words about open science and the evolving scholarly record, then turn to the changing role of the librarian, and finally, conclude with some observations on what success might look like. So in terms of assessment and review, a variety of agents at play here, government and through government, the public at large, the research funders, the universities, and the researchers. I've mentioned already that pattern of national and global research assessment, the um, research assessment exercise now, the REF in the UK, and similar activities in the Netherlands, in Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and in other countries. In the early days when all was safe and well in this um, body of activity, the methods were, were very much based on peer review. So in the early days of the REE, researchers were to identify their four best publications and submit them for assessment. In the PBRF, the quality evaluation was focused on evidence portfolios, which themselves were very much structured around peer review panels looking at publications. And the role for the librarians in that space really was about helping to capture and curate those outputs, either so that peer reviewers in the home institution could find what they were supposed to review, or to safeguard the publications in case the government wanted to verify that they did in fact exist, which was interesting for those of us working in New Zealand in the early days of the PBRF. But more recently, we've seen schemes come along that begin to look at different methods. And the um, Australian mechanism we saw the use of metrics in the science and engineering fields, and assessment was very much based on a numbers game rather than peer reviewers peer reviewing literature, which had already been peer reviewed. And in the REF in the UK, we've seen the impact statements sitting alongside the peer review of publications. And that becomes something of particular interest to us in our professional domain. Alongside these government-imposed schemes, we've got a range of ranking schemes, and they too have been growing in importance. Um, I know from my experience in different countries that governments around the world will use these ranking schemes, whether it's the Jiao Tong or the Times Higher, to identify places where they will fund their students to undertake graduate study, or places where they will strive to find research collaboration simply based on a very crude mechanism. When I was in New Zealand, we received a delegation from the Middle East, and we were somewhat surprised that they came to talk with us, and they explained that we were in the top three in the country in the Times World Rankings, and that was simply why they came to see us, even though we didn't have the medical school that they were actually looking to collaborate with. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and the, the, the Times World Rankings, uh, which seem to dominate, certainly on, on my campus, because it's the one where we do best, therefore it's the one, one we talk about most. Um, in that um, ranking system, 30% of the overall score for a university is based on research influence indicators, which are a proxy for citation counts. And I know that on my campus, any movement in these rankings, either of our institution or anyone else, immediately leads to an inquiry into why people have moved and what, it, um, you know, what our university's research looks like. And increasingly, people are saying, well, can we, in the way that we might manipulate our US News college rankings by growing the number of low enrollment courses, can we influence our Times World Ranking by publishing in particular outlets or not publishing in particular conferences or whatever? So there's a lot of interest in understanding how to drive performance in these systems. 
And again, it seems to be the librarians that are called upon to try and explain and interpret how these things move. More on that in a moment. Let's think about the research funders. They've got a variety of aims. They're really about particularly those publicly funded institutions like the research councils in the UK or the National Science Foundation in the US or the Australian Research Council. They are really about supporting research to improve the economic, social, and health outcomes of their nation, and also about growing the research capacity and research infrastructure in their countries. They do that largely by awarding research grants, and they need information on which researchers and which institutions are most likely to deliver the goods. We've seen that particularly sharpened in the US as a result of the sequestration after the economic crisis, the constraint imposed on gov government research funding, and the need to be even more careful that increasingly limited funds are applied to best effect. In turn, the research funders want to be able to demonstrate the impact of the research they have funded on those broader outcomes, whether it's about powering the innovation engine or about improving the health outcomes. <clears throat> We're also seeing a sharpening focus on scientific reproducibility as research funders require the curation of data sets, partly to allow others to build upon existing research, but partly to verify fund, um, research outcomes. As constrained funding is made available, they need to be sure that what is produced is what it says. Inside our institutions, we see a focus on, for example, benchmarking. How are we doing against our peers, both our existing peers and our aspirational peers? How do we allocate our research funds to best effect inside the institution? How do we showcase the quality of our research outputs? Not just scholarly outputs, but the things we do to support industry and society at large. What about the economic impact of our institutional research and our research impact more generally? How can we align our research strengths with national research priorities and how can we influence and shape the focus of these research priorities? For example, these from the National Health and Medical Research Council. And what about researchers themselves? How do I as a researcher look against the field? What's my research trajectory? How does all of this play into promotion and tenure in US universities in particular? How is my career being assessed by my peers and inside my institution? And at what point can I hang up the publication hat and go skiing in Colorado? How do I bid for funds? How do I express my research achievements in different ways? Uh, those of us in, in the US are wrestling at the moment with the new NIH biosketch, which requires um, five of our most significant contributions to science to be demonstrated. And how can we build the evidence for that, knowing full well that Einstein would have struggled to identify five discrete contributions to science? Um, and the impact statements for the REF I've already mentioned. So there's that sense of demonstrating what we've done and, and the impact and outcome of our research. What about the resource discovery elements? And I'm not talking here about this sort of resource discovery, but rather about finding our research collaborators, our potential collaborators, looking at the scholarly impact of collaborating with different institutions and in different disciplines and with industry, but also looking at our very discrete and unique research strengths, getting into a very fine level of detail and using that as a mechanism to identify researchers that we might hire to expand our capacity on campus or to identify rising stars or what we've seen in those countries with national research assessment agendas, the sort of transfer market that we commonly see in sports being applied in universities as people try to hire the best people to boost their standings. So let's turn now to the scholarly record and how all of this plays in. We've got some interesting movements underway. 
Uh, many of you will be familiar with the work that's coming out of Utrecht looking at the evolution of cloud-based research tools. I promised you, Rune, that I would make a quick plug for the survey that they are doing at the moment. Some of you will have seen this, um, where they're trying to encourage researchers to talk about the tools they use to try and refine and enhance this schematic. What they are offering is an institutional level um, URL for that survey so that you can find out inside your university what your researchers are using. And so catch me later on if you'd like to learn more about that. But what this allows us to begin to understand is how the scholarly record and its formation is changing over time. For many researchers, this traditional workflow remains dominant. They look at the web of science or at Scopus to find existing literature. They'll write their papers in Word, they'll publish in Nature, and so on. And this gives us a very closed institutional perspective. These are all tools that are licensed or paid for by the institution, and we've got a good sense of who is using what. But increasingly, in the world of open science, we're seeing a suite of tools being deployed which are signed up for by the researcher as an individual. They create their personal account and use it to good effect. But that begins to be quite challenging for us. If we are talking about showcasing the quality and impact of our research, yet the scholarly record is sitting outside the institution, how are we to manage that? I don't have an answer, unfortunately, but I'm acutely aware of the problem. Uh, we had a case recently where a very large research funder that operates in Washington, D.C., came asking for a data set which a postdoc had kept in their private personal fixture account and they had moved overseas and we couldn't get it. So the open science world is very much driving a lot of these activities. We are seeing, um, you know, this is an example from Figshare where um, observations are being captured in real time on a laptop on the scientist's bench and immediately being exposed to the world through Figshare before the researcher has analyzed them. And this begins to shape and change our understanding of the scholarly record and the research impact. We were all fairly comfortable in the world of the scholarly journal article and when we thought about how to assess impact, we could turn to the tried and tested Scopus, Web of Science, Google Scholar citation counts. But with the evolving scholarly record, we see things change a little bit. And we begin to look not just at citation counts, not just at numbers of times viewed, but at the number of shares and saves and discussions that take place in the broader landscape. We need to understand how to advise our researchers on campus and how to understand and interpret what that tells us. Um, at CMU, we are one of the half dozen or so development partners with QDOS, which is based in Oxford, trying to help researchers weave a narrative around the sort of data points I've just shown. Um, Impact Story has taken a different perspective with a variety of ways in which people can demonstrate the impact of their outputs. And all of this turns around to the question of where the librarian stands in all of this. This was if you're interested, do a Google Scholar image search for librarian, and this is the first picture that comes up. Um, go figure. But if we think about how librarians have had to evolve across the changing nature of what it means to be a library and a librarian, we see a shift away from the more conventional model of building collections and helping people make use of those collections, answering questions and so on, into the notion of the information specialist on campus. Number of reports coming out in different countries about how to evolve the liaison model, perhaps giving up on the liaison model, as Jan mentioned yesterday, into a very different professional service. But what we do know, uh, this is the body of professional knowledge from the Chartered Institute of Librarians and Information Professionals in the UK, that our traditional skill set very much can evolve from the conventional library setting into the world of research impact, reputations, rankings, and so on. 
we need to deploy that to best effect, to build success for our profession and for our institutions. When I was at the University of Queensland in Australia, as we were thinking about how best to support the university's performance in the ERA scheme, we built an architecture that focused around the institutional repository at the heart of it. And that worked well. The university did tremendously well, at least in part, I hope, because of the library's intervention in understanding how our publications would look when assessed under different subject categories. But three or four years on, we see a very different landscape, one where we have um, author identifiers, we have the citation database, we have open access repositories and publication outlets, and a variety of tools like SciVal and Insights, which bring different perspectives into the institutional landscape. We have an opportunity using services like Vivo to allow researchers to showcase their work and to build it alongside all of these tools inside the institutional architecture, whether we're using Symplectic or some other mechanism. It's a very rich picture today, even five years on from what we were doing in Australia. I do believe that we are poised to make the move. I know that some librarians feel that they need a bit of a head start. You know, we've got, for example, in Leiden training programs on bibliometrics and citation analysis for librarians and information specialists. But when we build up the skill set and the confidence of our colleagues, we can begin to deploy services like this one from UQ, um, where the bibliometricians are reaching out to the research community on a, a constant basis. They're, they're called upon persistently to consult and advise on the whole sweep of things. And maybe at last, that old Elsevier advert with the librarian really at the heart of the clinical process or the research process can come to bear in this world of research reputation rankings. And with that, and with 40 seconds to spare, I will stop. Thank you.